seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Please join in the prayer to confession. Loving God, sometimes the burden of our sin seems too much to bear. Our souls are heavy, our hands are bound by ropes strong and stout, and there are chains of iron across our backs. But you have promised to set us free, leading us from the land of sin, and into your kingdom of hope and promise. Give us now the courage to hear your voice calling to us. Come home, come home, you who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, sinner, come home. Hear us, O God, as we pray to you, both in the spoken voice and the silence of our hearts. My friends, hear the good news and believe it. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Like a good shepherd, he calls us by name. He searches for us day and night, and he will never leave until he has found us and led us home to the Father. The peace of God be with you all. And also with you. Let us offer signs of peace and reconciliation.
Please join in a prayer for illumination. Almighty God, in your hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our first lesson today is from John 15, 9 through 17. <clears throat> As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands, so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. nice. Good morning. It's so nice to be back with you. Thanks to Sarah and Andy for filling this pulpit the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, I worshiped at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. It's a little bit bigger than this place, but <laughs> the, uh, service, the service was very much the same. And our music is better, but don't, don't tell them. They think they're onto something there. 
Um, if you didn't have a chance to read the newsletter, our tour of Scotland was abruptly ended when I tested positive for COVID. And uh, we had to make an early retreat from, from the old world back to the new. Um, fortunately, I am recovered and glad to be with you today. Our second lesson today comes from the epistle of John. First John, chapter 5, we begin reading at the first verse. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. The love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. This is the Word of God. Timothy sat cross-legged on the old quilt covering the lower half of the bunk in his room at the top of the stairs of the house where he lived with his father and mother. He didn't really need a bunk bed since he was an only child. But his parents said it would be nice to have in case he ever wanted to invite a friend to stay overnight, except he never did, or rarely. In fact, right now, it seemed like he never had any friends at all, let alone one that might want to spend the night sleeping in the upper part of his bunk bed. Timothy sat cross-legged on the quilt on his bed, shaking an assortment of coins from the piggy bank that belonged on his dresser. It was a tedious process to get money out of that old bank with a narrow slot at the top, getting money out, especially when you're trying to do it quietly so your mother won't hear and come poking her nose into your affairs, asking questions you didn't want to answer. But finally, the last of the coins jiggled free from the pig and fell with a plop onto the quilt. Altogether, Timothy had three quarters, six dimes, five nickels, and 12 pennies, a grand total of $1.72. Wasn't a lot, but it was a start. Besides, he knew he didn't have a choice after what all had happened. And even just thinking about it made Timothy feel cold and alone, made him feel what he would one day learn to call brokenhearted. So no, the way he saw it, there wasn't any choice. Moving as if in slow motion, he got up off the bed and jammed the coins into the right front pocket of his blue jeans, got out his backpack and dumped out all the school books. He wouldn't be needing those where he was going stuffed a pair of shorts, two t-shirts, a change of underwear, one blue sock, one red sock, and his favorite SpongeBob pajamas into the pack where the books had been. Got out his battered flashlight that still worked when you shook it just right. Added in two Hershey bars saved from his birthday party. Debated about taking along the little silver knife he kept in the drawer of the nightstand beside his bed. Oh yes, that little silver knife, the source and cause of all his problems, the one he received in the big trade he had engineered with Jimmy Graham. Timothy was eight and so was Jimmy, so it wasn't really a case of one taking unfair advantage of the other. In fact, at first, Timothy thought he was the one who came out ahead to make the great trade. So great, in fact, he almost told his father about it. The little silver knife with the two blades, the one for cutting and the other for filing, or it could also be used as a screwdriver. Timothy 
He had seen Jimmy with a knife after school one day, and he really, really wanted it. And he started thinking about the, the pocket knife that his father kept on his dresser. It only had just the one blade, and it couldn't be used for anything else. In fact, as far as Timothy could tell, his father never used it for anything at all. So yes, Timothy had taken the knife from his father's dresser, taken it unseen and without asking, and he had traded Jimmy, his father's knife, the one he never used, for the little silver one with the two blades. Wouldn't you know it? Wasn't but a day or two later when Timothy's father asked his mother at dinner if she had seen the pocket knife he always kept on his dresser. It was such a good one, he said, and had cost him so much money he hardly ever used it. And now he couldn't find it anywhere. And he asked his wife if she had seen it, and no, she said, she hadn't. And then she turned to Timothy and asked him directly if he had seen it or anything. And no, he said, looking her square in the eye. He had not, he said. And all at once, sitting there at the dinner table, Timothy realized three terrible things. First, he had taken something that did not belong to him, something his father, as it turned out, unexplicably, seemed to value very highly. Stealing! That's what Timothy figured they would call that. Second, he had made a fool's deal trading what turned out to be a very expensive, high-quality knife for what amounted to little better than a fingernail foul. Stupid, he figured that one was called. And third, he had denied any knowledge of the entire incident in response to his mother's direct question, and he knew what that was called too. An unworthy son, Timothy wasn't able to put it in those exact words, but that's how he felt. A thief, a liar, and stupid to boot. So that's why it was that he didn't have any choice. His father could never forgive such a thing, or his mother either. They could never love him again. They could never trust him again. So he'd have to run away from home. He'd have to hide somewhere and never come back. So it is with a grim sense of defiance, he stuffed the little silver knife into his pocket along with the quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies, slung his backpack over his shoulder, snuck down the stairs, shut the front door quietly behind him. Eight-year-old Timothy heading out into the great world and wide, Unloved and unlovable, he could never go home again. For no matter what happened to him, no matter how bad it got, he could never be bad enough to make up for what he had done to his mother and father. The epistle, the letter known as 1 John, is memorable for addressing its readers as children, little children. Beloved, the author of the letter is traditionally said to be the same person who wrote the Gospel of John, sharing as they do similar concerns and ideas, even a similar vocabulary. We can imagine the writer as quite an old man, as a man with significant status and standing in the church, or at least in his part of it. In other words, we can imagine him as someone in a position to address the rest of us as children, as little children, addressing us as such without sounding patronizing, but rather endearing, loving, concerned. And love, it's a constant theme of the letter. Love for God, love for one another. Beloved, let us love one another, writes John, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. 
God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us, sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Did you count them? That's the word love used 10 times in just a few short sentences. And so John's point, my friends, is this. We, you and I, stand in a relationship to God, much as Timothy stands in respect to his parents. No matter how old we may be, in other words, we always stand as children in the sight of God. We stand as little children with God as our loving parent. God as a loving and forgiving parent. An understanding of the atonement developed by Peter Abelard, a French philosopher and theologian born in 1079, a man whose fame as a teacher made him one of the most celebrated figures in 12th century Europe. Abelard began teaching in Paris in 1108, and in 1117, he became the tutor of a young woman, yes, that's right, Eloise, the niece of Flaubert, a canon of the Cathedral de Notre Dame, Paris. Eloise, Abelard, fell in love, as you may have heard, and in due course, she gave birth to a son. At Abelard's insistence, they married secretly, and he then persuaded Eloise to take holy vows at the Benedictine Abbey of saint Argentuel. Her uncle, first enraged by the relationship and later somewhat placated by the fact of their marriage, finally decided that Abelard had abandoned Eloise at the abbey and sent a group of men to accost him in his room, leaving him physically emasculated. At this point, Abelard also retired to a religious retreat at the Abbey of Saint-Denis en France in Paris. But before long, he was forced to flee that retreat as well, having come under severe criticism for his writings on the Trinity. So he decided to found his own chapel, which he called the Paraclete, a reference to the Holy Spirit, and the place where Eloise was later to be called as abbess to the convent. And it was at that place, that time, when and where the famous exchange of letters between Eloise and Abelard took place, letters that rapidly became classics of romantic correspondence between a man and a woman. For, unfortunately, Abelard continued to suffer condemnations for his writings and was finally forced to accept the protection of Peter the Venerable in Cluny, where he died in 1142. At Eloise's direction, his body was taken back to the Paraclete, where she continued her work in sight of his very tomb for another 22 years. And when Eloise died in 1164, she was buried beside him until finally, in 1817, both bodies were removed to a single tomb in Paris, where they remain to this day famous lovers and also famous theologians. Here's how Abelard writes about the atonement. That is to say about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as the Son of God, and what all that has to do with the salvation of humankind. We're sitting cross-legged on our quilts, you and I, all of us, really, all of humanity, sitting cross-legged, counting out the coins from our piggy banks, determined to run away, for we know we've been bad. We know we've broken God's laws and commandments. We know we've been selfish and self-centered, and proud, and arrogant, and greedy, and uncaring, and yes, even cruel and callous, especially in relation to the needy of the world. Sometimes we've even been violent and destructive. Given this kind of behavior, 
we feel unloved, indeed even unlovable. We're aware of our Heavenly Father, of his presence, even as Timothy can hear his mother stirring around downstairs, cooking dinner for him and his father. But if she only knew how bad he really was, thinks Timothy, she would not be fixing dinner for him. And his father would not be coming home from work to greet him as his beloved son. And so he runs away, hiding from his parents, even adopting a kind of defiant attitude toward them, a chip on his shoulder, determined to live out the consequences of his own actions. That's how we as humans, sinful humans, relate to God, says Abelard. At first, after the fall, that is to say, after we as humans became aware of our sin, God comes into the garden in the evening seeking us directly, calling out, Adam, where are you? Hmm. But we know he's really angry with us. We know he only wants to find us in order to punish us. Because we know had he offended against us, as we have offended against him, we know how angry we would be. So we hide. We refuse to come out even when God calls. We hide in the little cubby under the door to the cellar, sitting on the damp ground, sitting there in the dark, feeling the spider webs, the creepy crawlies, hearing our parents call, Adam, where are you? hearing them calling but not coming out, not even after we've eaten both Hershey bars and night is well fallen. Finally, in response to this absence, God, who wants nothing more than to find us so that he might be reconciled with us, God sends his son into the world to look for us, to search us out, to find us, coming into the world like an older brother, like our brother, coming into the world like the older brother Timothy never had, coming to seek us out, to tell us it's okay. We can go home. God, our Father, loves us. He really does. And nothing, nothing, can ever change that or erase it or cancel it or take it away. We don't have to continue in our isolation and misery and our defiance and shame. We don't have to live in the dirt and the dark and the dankness of the cellar. We can walk out into the light, out into the open, into our homes, into the arms of our worried and anxious parents. Jesus comes into this world to do many things, but in the end, he comes to tell us one thing. God loves you, and nothing can ever separate you from that love. No, neither in this world nor the next. Indeed, not even the gates of hell can prevail against the love of your Father. Well, it's a hopeful message we hear from our brother Jesus. We think maybe he's on to something. We even begin to believe him, at least at first. But part of us, the biggest part, remains to be convinced. And then in the midst of our indecision, something terrible, terrible happens to our brother, to this friend, to this Jesus. Arrested on some trumped up charges, condemned by his own people, condemned also by the ruling Romans, handed over to a mob who mock him and beat him and spit on him, and finally nailed to a cross and left to die a dreadful and disgraceful death in the company of thieves. <laughs> Where's God's love in this, we demand. God allows even this one, this dear one as good, as pure, as sinless as Jesus allows him to die like that. We can only imagine what he will do to the likes of us with all our sins and shortcomings. But then, standing at the foot of that cross, looking up at the broken body, bleeding body of our brother, a realization comes upon us. This Jesus, 
He's not just human like you and me. I mean, he is that. He is human. But he's also God. And that's when we know what God has done for us. All of a sudden, we know God has allowed God's self to be taken to the cross. It's God dying there on that cross, dying that we might live. And that, my friends, is how much God loves us. A parent ready and willing to die in order that his child, that her child, might live. Shutting the front door quietly behind him on his journey out of town, Timothy got as far as the end of the block before his eyes filled with tears. He couldn't possibly see it across the busy street he knew he wasn't supposed to be crossing anyway. He stopped. He hesitated. He turned this way, and he looked that way. And then, without thinking, he surprised even himself by rushing back home, backpack thumping with every step. And he threw open the front door, and he ran down the hall into the kitchen, and he yelled out to a startled mother standing there by the stove mashing potatoes. He yelled out, I did it! I did it! I took it! And I lied about it! And I'm sorry! I'm so sorry! He wailed before collapsing into the arms of a young mother, still trying to figure out just exactly what her son could possibly be talking about. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, writes John. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it? that conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That night at dinner, his father sitting in his accustomed place at the head of the table, holding that little silver knife in his big hands, rough and calloused from hard work, he opened first the blade that cuts, and then the blade that fouls were, that could also be used as a screwdriver. He turned it over in his hands with a bemused look on his face, and he assured Timothy it was indeed one of the finest cutting instruments he had ever seen. And he was sure it would serve him well for many years to come. But more than anything, said Timmy's father, he wanted Timothy to have it, to keep it, to use it himself. And I believe he did. I believe he does. Thank you. 
Now let us stand as we affirm our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through all, him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism, for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, we come into your presence today with our faces turning red and our knees beginning to buckle. We, we know we have done wrong. We know we are not worthy of your love or forgiveness. The world over which you have given us dominion is a total mess with wars on several fronts, sickness and disease continuing to rage, hunger and homelessness all too common. We stand daily on the verge of nuclear disaster and we are learning to our dismay that climate change is all too real. What can we do but to confess our sins as we place ourselves, our lives, our world, wholly and firmly into your hands? And so we lift up to you those who are sick and who need your care. We remember children separated from parents, the elderly left alone and without care. We grieve over cities and towns and hospitals and schools and homes reduced suddenly to rubble by bombs and missiles. We are horrified by the ease and efficiency with which we are willing to kill each other for reasons that make no sense or indeed for no reason at all. We ask that you would be with us, every man, woman, and child in our land and in every land, that you would hold us close and keep us safe, that your love for us as your children would melt the coldness of our hearts and fill us with the compassion, decency, caring, and kindness that you intended for us from the very beginning. Thank you for loving us, O oh God, and help us to love you back with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, even as we pray in the words Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us join in the words of the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, strong and faithful God. All your works, the height and the depth, echo the silent music of your praise. In the beginning, your words summoned light. Night withdrew and creation dawned. As ages passed unseen, waters gathered on the face of the earth and life appeared. When the times at last had ripened and the earth had grown full in abundance, you created in your image man and woman, the stewards of all creation. You gave us breath and speech that all living might find a voice to sing your praise and to celebrate the creation you call good. And so now with all the powers of heaven and earth, we sing the ageless hymn of your glory. On the night of his arrest, our Lord took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke that bread. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Also after supper, our Lord took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said to his disciples, this cup is a new covenant poured out for you in my blood. Drink all of you from this cup in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And therefore, let us keep the feast.
Let us pray. Loving God, you graciously feed us and have received these holy mysteries with the bread and life and the cup of salvation. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom. For you have made us your own people by the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, and by the life-giving power of your Spirit. Amen. Today, on May 5th, we've declared it to be Appreciation of Music Day, a day when we give thanks, a special thanks to our choir, our pianist, our violinist, our music director. Uh, we're so grateful to have this opportunity. You'll find the liturgy in your bulletin on the last page. Music is an integral part of the work of the people of God. God's people have always sung. When the Israelites left Egypt, Moses sang. When Samuel was born, Hannah sang. When the exiles in Babylon, they wondered whether their song was heard. It wasn't. They still sang. The book of Psalms is an ancient song book. 
The early church included spiritual songs and hymns in the singing of the Psalms. We have been singing ever since. Today, You have used your gift of song, of harmony, of weaving together instruments and voices as an offering of God and praise and thanksgiving. You have shared the message of the gospel and enriched our worship. Thank you, each one, for your commitment and for the joy you have shared with us in this season. And, uh, Alexa, our music director, has certificates for one and all. Invite the choir to stand and come on across as we hand out these certificates of appreciation and, and tell you their names in case you don't know who they are. This is Gabby Hyming. She is our youngest choral scholar. Yuru Chen, she was new to us this year. We've been so delighted to have her. Brianna Brady, thank you for your service. And Madison Hansen. She's up there. Yep. Dana Jinagu. And our newest scholar this year, Katie Stokes. Woody Adcock. Oh, we're out of order. Hang on a second. I've got one for you. <laughs> no, it's here. It's just I'm a little out of order. There's John's, John Leip. And Gavin Perez. Thank you for your service. David Daniel, Edward Funderburg. Here's Tom Koppel. Glad that you're here this morning. And one of our choral scholars that we have been praying for for a long time is Zahan Lu. She came to be with us today so that she sang first semester. Then she had went home and she to China and she had some surgery and that had an impact on her voice. And so we've been praying for your recovery and we're grateful for your service uh, this year. Of course, we wouldn't be complete without recognizing Isaias Ferreira, who is with us as our violinist and violist. Isaias, I have a thank you certificate for you here. Isaias uh, recently accepted a job. Uh, at a university back home in Brazil. So we have him for a little while longer and uh, we'll have a chance to celebrate him more fully at another service coming up. And of course, our amazing, wonderful pianist whom we love so much, Spencer Hartman, we thank you for your service today. Last but not least, <laughs> We have our music director with gratitude from the members and friends of this church. We hereby honor our music director on this Music Appreciation Sunday, May 5th, 2024, Alexa Brown. Thank you for your tireless efforts and outstanding leadership and devotion to the music program of our church. We appreciate your wonderful music ability and your willingness to share your gifts so freely with us. Thank you. Thank you.
worship today. We invite you to be back again next Sunday. I charge you now to leave this place with a song in your heart. And when you're down, when you're blue, when you're not sure what to do, sing a song of praise to the Lord God who loves you more than you can ever know. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you and keep you today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.